Paul, when I ask scientists about God or religion, I generally find two categories of answers. One is completely irrelevant, nonsense, don't even want to waste my time talking about it. I may say it more politely, but that's the, that's the truth. Second is, sure, science and religion should be, are both real, but they are two completely different areas that have no interaction whatsoever. And science should do its thing. Religion, if it wants to go do its thing, I won't interfere. You don't think that way. You think there, there can be a way that science can say something about God or the nature of reality. Science and religion start from opposite poles. Science starts on the basis that all knowledge is provisional, uh, it must be testable, that we put forward hypotheses about the world, and we change our minds if the experiments show that we're wrong. Religion, most religions start with an act of faith, that there are certain things that are true, must be accepted to be true, uh, they're not really testable. Uh, and the question is, do they meet somewhere in the middle that can be mutually productive? And I've always thought that there is a, a useful meeting ground. What tends to happen is that the science informs the religion more than the other way around, but, but it is a two-way traffic. I'll give you a concrete example that has impressed me. Uh, there's been a long tradition of uh, theological inquiry into the nature of time and God's relation to time. Mm. You can see the problem immediately. Uh, it goes back to Augustine, you know, what was God doing before he made the universe? And uh, the, the quip was, well, uh, busy making hell for the likes of you who would ask such a question. Uh, but a more considered answer is that the world was made with time and not in time. That was Augustine's answer. Uh, in other words, he took God right outside of time, so we didn't have this notion of a being who was supposed to be all good and all perfect, who nevertheless at some particular moment made up his mind to, to have a universe, and snap, there was a universe. You know, why didn't he make it before if it's such a good idea? Uh, and so by taking God outside of time, all of those problems went away. But those problems were replaced only to... Uh, but those problems were solved only to be replaced by another. Uh, namely, that if God is a truly timeless being, eternal in the sense of being outside of time altogether, uh, then what meaning could one attach to things like uh, prayer and, uh, and the God appearing in uh, a historical sequence uh, with the, uh, you know, the creation and the fall and the uh, incarnation and the resurrection and so on, all the stuff that people want in religion. They want to see God at work through the historical sequence. Can you make any sense of an atemporal God, a God who is outside of time, entering into history in any sort of meaningful way? Well, there's no real answer to that, and theologians have debated over whether you can have uh, God both temporal and atemporal uh, for, for years and years and years. But now along comes physics. What can physics say about this? Well, Einstein showed us that time is not some sort of arena. Space and time are not just there, uh, the great arena in which the drama of nature is acted out. They are part of the cast. That is, space and time are part of physics just as, as much as matter and force. And that if you believe the universe came into existence with the Big Bang, then space and time could have come into existence with the Big Bang as well. Just as Augustine said that the world was made with time and not in time. So physics tells us that time is part of the physical universe. And if you want to have a God who is somehow responsible for this physical universe, then this God has to be outside of time. So it supports the notion of a timeless being. So that's one concrete way, I think, in which science can inform theology. Give an example of how theology can inform science. Well, uh, yes, uh, because uh, theology is far less concerned, I think, with um, explaining the world in terms of space, time, matter, and causes, and so on. Much more concerned uh, with living the good life, uh, with um, uh, ideas of right and wrong, with spiritual enlightenment, with uh, having a life that is uh, somehow richer than it would be otherwise. Uh, and, uh, and I think that in terms of um, what has, has religion got to say for science, well, there's thousands of years of careful reflection on the nature of, of what a good life might be. And so that's where I think we can see something in the opposite direction. You don't go to a physicist, for example, to ask about right and wrong, or good and evil, or anything of that sort. Uh, so uh, I, I would think that the religious tradition uh, is of greatest value when it comes to the world of human affairs, as opposed to the Big Bang, or the laws of physics, or something. How about the uh, impact of 
the latest theories in uh, fundamental physics or cosmology or even mathematics about defining what reality is, does that constrain the theologian in a sense to come up with their um, uh, envisions of reality because of the, the constraints that, that, that science is putting on them? I suppose it would be a pretty poor theologian who would say, well, I can't get away with this or that idea of God uh, because science tells me that this isn't a fashionable way of uh, looking at the nature of the world. Uh, in a way, uh, I've given the example of, of time, the nature of time, that it is uh, physicists think of time as part of the physical universe. And so uh, if what you want is a God who is uh, somehow transcending the physical universe, this would better be a timeless God. Uh, but that isn't going to stop somebody like a process theologian who thinks, well, uh, they're much more comfortable with the notion of a God who is not uh, eternal and unchanging and perfect, but a God who is sort of all muddled up with the evolution of the universe and is part of the, of the cosmic story. Uh, so I think, you know, theologians will have what they want, uh, irrespective of what, uh, what science has to say on the matter. But where I think that, that science is important is that any... Uh, religion that's worth its salt that completely ignores science uh, is probably not going to survive for very long because we, after all, we live in a scientific world. Uh, people have choices and they can look at the scientific view of the world and they can turn their backs on that. They can say, well, uh, I understand science is saying these things, but I'm going to ignore that and I'm going to believe some completely different set of stuff. But come back in a hundred years uh, and I think that 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 different set of stuff isn't going to survive. In today's world, the fight is generally over biology and evolution, but, but I think those are transitory and, and perhaps even trivial. Where the most interesting areas are, are in fundamental physics and cosmology, because this really defines the essence of the entire universe and the, and the potential for meaning and purpose. I have to say, I agree with you entirely. I think this whole business about uh, evolution and God and design and all that stuff uh, is 100 years out of date. All of this came out at the time of Darwin, in fact, even before Darwin, and most professional theologians are completely comfortable with the notion that life has evolved uh, slowly and steadily over billions of years, and there are random mutations and selection, and that whole Darwinian thing is just fine, and it doesn't in any way undermine their belief that there is an ultimate meaning or purpose to the universe as a whole. And so I think it's all a bit of a side issue, uh, where I think we really do get down to the uh, fundamental brass tacks uh, is where we're dealing with the underlying laws of the universe, its rationality, the whole big cosmological picture. Um, now, many people think, well, uh, that is somehow, you know, pushing God out to be something really remote, that they, they're comfortable with the idea of a God who's sort of working miracles uh, here on Earth within the, uh, yeah, <laughs> sort of within the sort of evolutionary picture. That's what they want. They're not much interested in a God who's uh, the grand architect of the great cosmos, but is somehow sort of billions of light years away or not in space and time altogether. Um, but again, if we look at the history of scholarly theology and we uh, think of the, of the work of people like Augustine and Aquinas and so on, that was the sort of God they had. Uh, it was a, you know, an abstract God who uh, is sort of underpinning the laws of, uh, of the universe, uh, maybe akin a little bit to, ma to mathematics and the rules of, of geometry. When you look at uh, Aquinas's various proofs of the existence of God, you're reminded of the mm. uh, project of Euclidean geometry. It's got that sort of feel to it. Uh, and so uh, this may not satisfy most people who yearn for a meaning in their lives that can be provided by a personal God and have a relationship through prayer and uh, worship and so on. Um, what I'm talking about is something much more remote and abstract, and it, it probably doesn't meet most people's needs. But in terms of uh, the world of the scientist, uh, and in particular the you know, atheistic scientists that, that I mix with, uh, that's, that's the, the ground for productive discussion, I think. Well, I think what you're saying uh, is what can be entailed by the laws of physics and cosmology, but it wouldn't, by logic, rule out that type of personal God, would it? I, yes. Uh, I don't think uh, that, that what I've been saying about uh, the laws of physics or cosmology or anything of that sort rules out the notion of a God as, um, as a person, but with one major qualification, uh, that... I've never been happy with the idea of a God who uh, intervenes from time to time in the running of the world. I often say there's no miracles except the miracle of nature itself. The true miracle is the 
the wonderful package that is put together and works so well. And the idea uh, that the universe could uh, have been sort of started off by a super being who then gets a bit unhappy and starts tinkering around with moving atoms about and changing genomes and all that sort of thing to fix it up as, uh, as it goes along, I think is uh, a very uh, dissatisfying view of, of both science and theology. So I've never liked that idea. Um, but the, the problem is, you see, for people who want to believe, for example, that they, their prayers may be answered, or at uh, least heard. Uh, that's right. That, that if this God is outside of time and is some abstract entity uh, and is, isn't a, a being who can respond in some way and make changes, even if it's changes, you know, even when you say, well, um, uh, that I've had some divine revelation, there's something here in my head, some experience, which I've never had, but, you know, some experience in my head that is sort of put there by God, for example, well, then that's, there still must be some corresponding physical change, sure. some atom that was going to go to the left has gone to the right because God has done this. Uh, and that uh, makes me feel very uneasy. First of all, because I, as a scientist, I'd like to believe that the, the entire world can be explained through science and all the things that happen have sci good scientific naturalistic explanations. Uh, but secondly, I don't like the idea of a God who is a sort of mainly like an absentee landlord, pops up from time to time and you know, prods a few things around. Uh, but it is hard, then. It's hard for people to gain much comfort from this remote entity. Now, it's got a sort of austere majesty, I think, uh, and, and beauty to it, that there is a sort of, you know, grand cosmic meaning out there. Uh, but it may well pass you and me by. You know, it could be that we're just tiny components in this grand scheme. But the scheme as a whole is going somewhere or means something. So that is enough for me, but I'm sure it's not enough for most people, uh, most churchgoers, for example, who might expect to pray and, and uh, get something back out of it, no, uh, no, other no. than just a, a nice feeling. I don't want to be callous about this, but I don't think the issue is what makes people feel good or not feel good. The issue is is how closer to reality or it's closer, closer to, to truth, truth pardon the pun, right. we That's can right. get. Yep, and it may be that we simply have to accept that uh, these thousands of years of tradition of a guardian angel type of God, a personal being, uh, being with whom we can have a personal relationship and who will look after us and make sure nothing truly dreadful will happen. Maybe we just have to let that go and uh, find inspiration from science and from what we find at the scientific frontier, which I don't think uh, paints a picture of a cold, meaningless, heartless universe in which human beings have no place. I think we have a place. It's not a central place. We're not the pinnacle of creation. We're not at the center of the universe. But we have a role nevertheless, and I think that is enough to sustain me. And the message I see that my constituency, my natural constituency, is those people who have turned away from traditional religion uh, with disillusionment, but are still casting around for a meaning to their lives. They've lost their spiritual moorings, if you like. Uh, so I think uh, science can go some way to replacing that, because uh, science isn't a religion. It's not going to be a substitute for religion, but it can provide a framework of ideas in which I think there can be a genuine spiritual dimension uh, without having to go back to the guardian angel view of, of God. <laughs>